All right, guys, we are working on putting some of the things together that we've done so far. So if you recall, we know a couple of things. Sorry, my pen is so crazy. I am actually borrowing my son's DS stylus because I left my stylus at work. So anyway, um, we know things like rate is equal to change in some measurable property over change in time. We talked about that at the very beginning. And we also know that um, rate is equal to the rate law constant times the concentration of the reactants raised to some power. This is the one that we're going to tend to use more often in, in terms of a lot of our calculations, except that the problem is is that the rate is not really measurable. It was easily measured like when we did the lab in that we were measuring a color change, but it's difficult to measure, for example, a change in concentration without taking into account time. And so the first definition here does take into account time, but when we actually use our rate law, there's no time in, in the equation itself. And so what we need to do is actually put these two equations together so that we're able to measure something, literally measure something with a stopwatch um, and put those together. So if you pull out the worksheet that you should have picked up in class, it's got three columns on it um, and it says, you know, zero order, first order, second order. What I want to do is to just kind of take you through those fairly quickly. Um, and the whole point of those that worksheet is to kind of show you some of the really important things that you need to know and to take you through the calculus. And so, first of all, those of you who have not had calculus, don't worry about it. If you have not had it, I'm not going to ask you to derive it. It's just I would like um, those of you who have calculus or are in calculus to kind of see where those things have derived from. So, let me scroll down here. Um, we're going to look at these one at a time. And so we're just going to, I'm going to focus on them one column at a time. So this first column is a zero order reaction. And so a couple of things I just want to focus on. First of all, here is our rate definition. And you'll notice, first of all, that the rate is negative. And that's because for this worksheet, we're going to be making the assumption that we have um, A as our reactant. Let's just say it's turning into B. And so as we look at rate, it's a negative because A is a reactant, and so it's going to do the change in the negative change in the concentration of A over change in time. The other thing that I also mentioned to you is the second thing. This is actually the rate law constant here, and you'll notice it's zero order, so it's to the zero power. And so we're going to just kind of do some manipulation. That's what's on here. So you'll notice that this next equation here is just putting those two equal to each other. Now at this point, if you are not a calculus student, then you don't need to be concerned with kind of this next set of things because this group right here is actually kind of running this through the calculus machine, taking the change and just making it negative d dA over dt, um, then doing a little bit of rearranging. Of course, here, a to the zero power is going to just be equal to one, so it disappears, and then taking, integrating it from zero to time t, and just taking the integral of that. So this is kind of running it through the calculus machine. So this is not something I'm going to ask you to do, but it's just for your knowledge. And here's one thing I'm going to totally ask those of your calculus uh, gurus. Um, I, as I made this worksheet and I was doing all the typing, I am sure that I probably made typos in the calculus of it, um, just trying to make sure I hit everything. So if you find any typos, please, please, please let me know so that I can fix them on any of these columns. All right, so here are some things that, that become important then, since I'm not going to ask you about that. This equation here. Here's what makes this equation important. The, this um, concentration of A that, that sub-zero is referring to at time zero, so that's the original concentration of A, um, minus the concentration at time T 
is equal to kt. So that k is still the rate law constant and t is time. And so what this becomes important for us to know is that if we know the rate law constant, k, and we know the original concentration at time zero, and we let it run for a certain number of seconds, we can predict what that final concentration will be. And so it allows us to have another equation that's a little bit more useful to us. Now, as we continue down this, you'll notice this very next thing here is actually just a rearrangement of the above one that I circled in green. And the reason I rearranged it is so we can see how it matches the slope of a line. Um, so a t concentration of A at time t, you'll notice that the slope here is negative k, um, our y-intercept. And so if we were to graph this, and we graph the concentration of A versus time, first of all, we would see it's decreasing because it's a reactant. But we get a straight line when we graph the concentration of A versus time. Now you have to remember that this is very specific to a zero order reaction. That's what this entire column is all about. So that's an important thing to identify, and that's one of the questions that they often ask is when they're looking at different orders of the reactions is if you take a graph of the concentration of A versus time and you get a straight line, you would need to understand and recognize that that's zero order, and that's very different from what we would get with a first order or a second order. Um, finally then, down here, half-life. The half-life, that is very specifically defined to be, that's a terrible thing, boy, I don't like using this crazy little stylus. It's chewed on too from my son, he chewed it up, it's crazy. Um, anyway, half-life is by definition found when the concentration at time t is exactly half of what you started with. That's what is defined to be half-life. You're going to be most familiar with half-life when we talk about nuclear reactions because that's probably where you learned it. So this is just that same equation that we already discovered through the calculus machine. And by plugging in at time t this one half a naught, not really a naught, sorry, but a at times concentration of a at time zero, we can go ahead and plug it in and rearrange it. And we're going to start calling this t the one half, the half life, because now it's really defining it that. And the half, the time, the half life is represented by the initial concentration of A divided by 2 times the rate law constant. This might be something that's useful just in terms of if you were interested in knowing how long it takes for half of that to disappear. So that would be the first thing. All right, we're going to run through the others really quickly. Um, because they're very similar with some slight changes. All right, first order reaction. You'll notice we have the same things here and here. We're going to just put those together, um, and that is what, what we have in this second thing here, is to put the two together and equal. Again, now we're going to start running it through the calculus machine, and that's what these steps here are doing, is just making them like negative dA, dt, and then taking the integral of it, which leads us then into an equation you need to know, this equation right here. Now, for a zero order reaction, it was not on the useless information sheet. This one is on the useless information sheet, which means you do need to be aware and you need to know the one in the zero order because it wasn't there. But this one you will find on the useless information sheet. And so this is very specific. Once again, now this one is specific to a first order reaction. But if you, for example, know the initial concentration um, and you know how long you're going to let that reaction run and you know the rate law constant, you can find out what the final concentration will be. Or if you know the initial and final concentrations, you can figure out how much time has passed. So there's a variety of ways that you can use this equation just depending on your purpose. All right, this next line, same thing. Just rearrange to make it match the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b. So you can see, once again, the slope is negative k, because there it is right there. And so we're going to get a str another straight line. But notice, this time, what we're graphing is now the natural log of a. And so that's what's being graphed versus time in order to get a straight line. 
So in a first order reaction, if you graphed um, the, just the concentration of A versus time, you would not get a straight line. But if you graph the natural log of A versus time, you would get a straight line. So one of the ways that this is used is if you have the concentration of A at various times, you could graph it. If you graph the concentration of A versus time and you got a straight line, then you'd know it was zero order. If you graphed the concentration of A versus time and you didn't, well, then you would know it's not zero order. If you graph the natural log of the concentration of A versus time and you got a straight line, then you would know it's a first order reaction. And so that tells you something about the reaction. Bottom part, same idea. Half-life, this is where you're going to find, again, same ideas here, you guys. Okay, oh, I don't know what I just did there. I had to change my screen so that the stylus would work. Okay. <laughs> Weird. Um, at any rate, same thing. This is where um, concentration at time t is half of the original concentration. We know this to be true because that's what we got from the calculus machine just a rearrangement here in this next one um, and substitution here in order to substitute that in for the concentration of A at time t. What you end up with is the natural log of 2 um, there and so that's 0.693 and so you'll notice that the concentration of A isn't even in the half-life but the half-life is equal to 0.693 divided by the rate law constant. Um, this is something that you actually find in nuclear reactions because nuclear decay is a first order reaction. All right, last one, zipping right through it. Same idea here, you guys. Again, this is now second order. So the only thing that difference is, is now the substitution of its A squared here. Um, putting them equal to each other, cranking it through the calculus machine and then doing a little bit, here's what we get, but we're going to rearrange that. And what we'll find and what you'll find on the useless information sheet is actually this reaction. This one is on the useless information sheet. And again, this is the more useful form um, when you have a second order reaction. Uh, can use it for the same thing. Again, you know, we have a measurable value, which is time. We've got our concentrations. We've got our rate order, or our rate law constant, so we can use that. All right, same idea once again. Rearrange this so that it matches y equals mx plus b. And now you'll notice what actually corresponds to y is the inverse of the concentration of A at, at time t. So for this reaction, you're not graphing the concentration of A or the natural log of A, you're graphing the inverse of the concentration of A versus time. And the difference here is you'll notice that the slope, whoa, sorry guys, I just keep doing that to this crazy computer, um, is that the slope is actually positive here. So the slope is a positive K, which is why it has this kind of a slope. So once again, if you were given data of the concentration of A versus time, and you graphed you know, the concentration of A versus time, and you did not get a straight line, you graphed the natural log of A versus time, and you didn't get a straight line again, then you might consider graphing the inverse of the concentration of A versus time and seeing if you got a straight line. And if you did, then you would know that it was second order. So it gives you a little bit more information. And then the final part of this here, again, same idea, just plugging this in for half-life. This is what we know after cranking through the calculus machine for a second order reaction. Just doing a little bit of substitution for A at time T, um, and then rearranging and kind of simplifying it. What we end up with is if you're interested in knowing the half-life, the amount of time it takes for half of that um, substance to disappear, it would be the inverse of the initial concentration of A over the rate law constant. So what you should get out of this are some of the, are the calculus issues, go away, uh, 
are, are the, the final equations that I told you are on the useless information sheet with the exception of zero order, which you'll have to memorize. Um, you should be able to figure out based on a graph or based on data of concentration of A versus time if it's zero, first, or second order, and you would do that by taking a look at what kind of graph will give you a straight line. And in some situations, it might be helpful to know the half-lives. And you'll notice the half-lives are not given on the useless information sheet, but what I've tried to show you is that you could very easily derive them. So it isn't really necessary to memorize those. Um, you could figure that out very, very quickly. So that's going to end us here today. So we will uh, see you in class tomorrow. Bye-bye.